Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm excited to begin this series on different saints, people who have made a difference in our lives, a difference within the Christian church. And uh, I am so pleased to start off our series with Johann Sebastian Bach. <coughs> A little bit about uh, Bach and his life. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was uh, born in 1685 in Eisenach, Germany. And uh, he was a musician from the start. And uh, as often as it, as it was, it kind of went into in families. And, uh, and what Bach found was a, a life where he could make music and do so freely in, in many different places and situations. Um, and that time, music was very, very big in the churches, but also very important uh, in civic life, in the different courts uh, where the rulers uh, would sit and, and entertain people. Uh, Bach was and continues to be known as one of the greatest composers to walk the face of the earth. Uh, even to this day, the music that Johann Sebastian Bach will just simply stun and astound both those who play and those who listen to his music. Bach was also uh, a proficient uh, and a virtuosic organist and, uh, and was well known for that as well. Well, I, I fell in love with Bach primarily through... Uh, through the fact that, that I also was uh, somebody who was aspiring to write music. And, and I found a, a curious thing about something that Bach did with, on, on nearly all of his manuscripts. And you can kind of see it here. Uh, at the very bottom, at the very, when, when Bach would finish writing a piece of music, he would, he would sign it with the letters S, D, G. Or, sometimes, as you can see in the picture there, he would actually write out the words, Soli Deo Gloria. And, of course, that's Latin. And uh, what do you think that means? Soli is, is the word for only. Deo, we've been saying these, these last two a little bit because we just came from Christmas, right? Gloria and Excelsis, Deo. Deo is God. And Gloria is glory. You put all of those together, and you have only God glory. Now just think about that for a moment. Bach is one of the greatest composers of music in the history of the world. And he lived at a time when... The, the people who were writing the music, the people who were performing the music, even in the churches, were essentially the rock stars of their day. I know that's kind of a weird thought, because that's definitely not the way it is now, but it was the way it was for them at Box Day. If you wanted to be the rock star, go and get the, the highest position in the, in the greatest church, and you've got rock star status. And here's Bach. He's writing the very best music ever. And what does he do? At the very end of his, this, this writing, he wants to make sure that everybody who plays this music, everybody who hears this music, knows where the glory is supposed to go. It goes to God. This music was not written for the glory of Johann Sebastian Bach. He didn't care about that. He didn't want that. He didn't want the glory. He wanted to praise God with the gifts that he had been given. And so that, that, that was an inspiration to me, even. You know, as I was writing music, I wanted to make sure that the things that I would write would be to the glory of God. If you could advance this slide. Take a look here. We, uh, we can see from Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 16 to 17. This was from our epistle. This is a passage I think that, that Bach would have particularly loved. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And it's this next part uh, that I, I mean, the, the hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, yeah, that's, that is great. Of course, it's talking about music. But I would say that the very, this next one even hits it harder. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through you. And this is really the message that we had for our children, for the children today, right? Whatever you're doing, no matter if you're, if you're the greatest in something, or if you're really struggling with something, or if you're, if you're working on a project, or you're parenting obstinate children, or whatever it might be, give glory to God, give thanks to God. And especially together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come together and use all of these different gifts for the sake of the kingdom, all of these things put together, we can give glory to God. We can sign SDG onto the different things that we do in life. Solely, Deo glory to God alone be the glory. Well, this is not the only transcription that we find on box music. Sometimes, at the very beginning of the piece, you will see two little J's. And you can see that. I mean, you kind of might need to look close. It's in the upper left-hand corner there. You can see those two J's. And those J's, again, Latin, is Jesu Yuva, or Jesus Help. And I just love this. Because I, I, I get this. I get this. You've got a blank sheet of paper. The music's going in your head. And you think, how in the world am I ever going to get on that sheet of paper? <laughs> right? And, and I, I particularly love this picture because if you're in this block, it's such a terrible handwriting. Um, you, can, you can kind of make it out here, though. Um, the, this, is, this is the very first page of the St. Matthew Passion. And if you're familiar with music at all uh, of, this, of this era, this is a tour de force of music. This is Bach setting the entire passion story of Jesus all the way up to the cross. And when choirs perform this work today, they often break it up into two concerts. And they do it on two separate days because the thing takes about four hours to perform. Okay, can you imagine the blank sheet of paper staring you in the face and you know you've got a piece of that magnitude to write? Jesu, Yuva, Jesus, help, help, I, ah, uh, how in the world can I do this? And of course you think then somebody of a box talent and ability, and still he comes humbly before God saying, help me. I can't do this on my own. And that, and that makes me think of our epistle, the, uh, the gospel lesson for today. You know, we get this Canaanite woman coming up to Jesus whose, whose daughter is possessed by a demon, and she comes to Jesus and she cries out, Lord, help me. She realizes that she can't help her daughter on her own. She realizes that she can't handle this situation. She doesn't have the power. She doesn't have the strength. And it's just fascinating. I mean, Jesus comes to her and even says, hey, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. I mean, that'd be enough to drive anybody away, right? But she's persistent and yet still humble. And she's able to say, yes, but even, even the dogs get the crumbs off the master's table. Even the dog gets, dogs get the crumbs. I mean, you hear the humility there. And yet she's bold to continue to ask for help. I think there's a huge lesson there for us. I think there's a lesson there for us in humility. And, and you know, and, and our perceived self-sufficiency. You know, I know I struggle with this. You know, I, I think I've got it in hand. I think I've got it all under control. And, and, um, Often that doesn't work so well. Before we ever get started, we should be saying, Jesus, help. I can't do this on my own. 
So Bach wanted to serve God. Bach wanted to, to, to praise God with the gifts that he had been given. And he had lots of different opportunities to do so. But he also had some challenges. One of Bach's early positions was in the town of Mühlhausen. And uh, this is a picture from, uh, from Mühlhausen during his, the time when Bach was there. And Mühlhausen had a very interesting history. Mühlhausen was one of those kind of progressive cities. Um, when Back when, uh, when Martin Luther was, was having his reformation, uh, there was a guy by the name of Thomas Munster who famously debated Luther in Mühlhausen that Luther hadn't gone far enough with the Reformation. He needed to do more. He needed to go further with the Reformation. And Mühlhausen, even 150 some odd years later, um, was still very, very proud that their monster had stood up to Luther and, uh, and had, uh, had debated him there. Well, Bach comes into Mühlhausen. All he wants to do is praise God. All he wants to do is write his music. All he wants to do is give glory to God. At the end of the day, to give glory to God. But what he found there was a, a, a new kind of movement within the Lutheran church called pietism. Now, during Bach's time, music in the church was huge. Huge. Every part of the, the service was big and glorious, and there were these huge cantatas that would be sung, and the service went on for, like, hours. Okay. Well, the pietists looked at all of that, and they said, wait, wait, wait a second. That's, that's just too passive. We need the people to be more, uh, more together with this. We want the people to participate with this. We need the music to take a back seat rather than to be in the front seat. Well, you can imagine what somebody like Johann Sebastian Bach would think of that. His whole life was about putting the music right up front and saying, here is the beautiful, most beautiful way to praise God. And yet he had these pietists in town who were saying, no, you need to tone it down. Let's make it even worse. The pastor of Bach's church in Mühlhausen was a pietist. <coughs> you can imagine the conversations that they had. I mean, you can see, this was a threat to everything that Bach was trying to do. Now, how do we handle these things in our day and age when we find others who have a different ideology, one that we might consider to be a threat? I hate to say it, but we don't typically handle it all that well. I mean, as a society, what do we do? We have one camp over here, we've got another camp over here, and the whole point is to uplift your position while pushing down the other, right? I mean, that's essentially what we do. And, and there is animosity between the two groups, whatever they might be. And, and you can just take your pick of the different realms in which this happens. I mean, this happens in politics, this happens in social life, this happens in the church where we have these ideological positions and, and one is right and the other is wrong and both of them think they're right and both of them truly dislike the other and treat them that way. Right. This is actually something we're seeing a lot in our society right now. Bach could have very easily gone down that road. But he didn't. He had his disagreements with pietism. And people knew it. And eventually the time came for him to leave Mühlhausen. He had to go someplace where, where he had more freedom to do the work he needed to do. And we're very fortunate to have the, uh, the resignation letter that he wrote to the people of Mühlhausen. Now you would expect, here's his chance, right? He'd been waiting, and now he can go and rip on them. Because now he's leaving, and it doesn't matter what he says to these people. What we find in Bach's resignation letter is love and grace. And he did mention that there were challenges for him. He did. He put it out there. But he also said it in such a kind and considerate way that you just, you just kind of felt that he did even love the people he disagreed with. And what's more, the people of Milhausen wanted Bach to stay. 
even though he, was, he disagreed with the, the position that they had theologically. They wanted him to stay. Why? Because Bach could even love those he disagreed with. I think that's a powerful message for us. A message that, that we hear directly from Jesus. Jesus says, that how will people know the Christians? They will know the Christians by how they love each other. And we live in a sinful, broken world. Are we always going to agree on absolutely everything all the time? No. So while the world goes and, and, and develops their camps and, and starts throwing stones at each other, we, the Christians, can, can endure that by loving each other. Maybe even still kind of holding to our position, but still loving each other each other through all of that. That's what Bach was able to do. Because that's what Jesus taught him to do. And there would come a test for Bach later on in his life that where he would need to use those skills and more. One of the rock star positions for composers of that day was to be appointed and to be the cantor of the churches of Leipzig. Um, there, were, there were rock star composers who, who weren't able to take that position before him. They had to settle for mediocrity when they got Bach. Little did they know, right? Well, the interesting thing about the world at that time, especially, especially Leipzig too, was that Bach was hired by the city council to serve the churches of Leipzig. Now think about that for a moment. He was hired by the city council to serve the churches of Leipzig. Now already we're starting to see, this is gonna get interesting. But for them, church was just ubiquitous with society. It was just, it was just right there, it was all, all together. We couldn't even imagine a world like that today. But for them, it was all interconnected. So, hired by the church council to serve the churches. Well, he finds himself where? In the middle. And there are plenty of times when there were city council issues that involved Bach. And there were times when there were church issues that involved Bach. And there were even more times when the city council issues conflicted with the church issues and they all involved Bach. <laughs> so he finds himself curiously in the middle. Now remember, all Bach wants to do is to praise God with music. All he wants to do is give, give glory to God with the gifts that he's been given. And now he finds himself having to play politics to do it. And what we know of Bach is that he so wanted to, to continue to serve God in the ways he did, he was willing to do it. He was willing to play the politics. He was willing to play the game. He was willing to stand with the church council or the or the or the or the, the city council, or the church, or or more difficultly, stand in between them so that there might be peace. And we've talked about this in the past. This is a position that we Christians often find ourselves in. Where we can't put ourselves on one side or another but where we stand in between and we represent the way of peace, the way that Jesus has taught us. And it means that sometimes we have to be the ones to take the brunt from both sides. That's what happened to Jesus. Jesus stood between God and man and took the brunt of sin for us. And we are also called to be peacemakers, to be the sons and daughters of God as, as we stand in the gap, often willing to, to stand for truth when we don't have any advocates on our side. Bach found himself in that position time and time again, where he was standing between city council and church and working out solutions. Now, there were times when he was a peacemaker, and I'll be honest, there was times when he was a troublemaker. Um, but he sought to, to give glory to God everything that he did. This is the image that I showed the children a little bit earlier from Bach's Brandenburg Concerto. And I really want to send the same message to you that I did to the children. 
Every one of us have gifts and abilities. For Bach, it was these chicken scratches that turned into the greatest music that, that we have. But for each of one of us, God has given us gifts and abilities. And my prayer for each one of us is that we might be able to sign a D, an SDG onto everything we do. Soli Deo <coughs> So that at the end of the day, we can look back at all the things that we've done, the, the ways that our gifts and talents have been used, the, the things that God has done through us during that day, and we can say, Lord, this was not for my glory. This was for yours. And maybe even as you wake up in the morning, and you say, thank you, God, for waking me up. Thank you for giving me another day. Help. <laughs> Help me. I can't do it on my own. You've given me work to do. You've given me responsibilities. Sometimes they're overwhelming. Help me. By the grace that you've shown me. By the grace and forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. With the privilege of serving the Almighty God. Help me. <clears throat> so that finally when we sign off in this life and we move on to an eternity. The people who come after us might be able to look back even on these lives that are lived. And say that life was lived. For the glory of God, soli Deo, Gloria. Amen.